Grab a seat and get comfy as we dive into one of those mind-bending topics that just might make you see the universe in a whole new light. Today, we're exploring a concept as old as the stars themselves, the ether. Ancient civilizations, from the Greeks to the Vedic sages, all spoke of a mysterious, almost magical substance that pervaded the cosmos. They called it the ether. It wasn't just some mystical mumbo-jumbo. They genuinely believed this superfine, almost invisible medium was what made the stars sparkle and carry the light of day across the sky. Fast forward a few millennia, and you'll find some of the greatest minds in science scratching their heads over the same idea. Sir Isaac Newton, James Clerk Maxwell, and the enigmatic Nikola Tesla considered the ether essential for understanding how forces like gravity and light travel through space. Tesla, in particular, had some wild theories about it that even today are the stuff of legend. Let's rewind a bit to the early 19th century. Enter Michael Faraday, a pioneering scientist with a knack for experiments that would make anyone's head spin. Faraday wasn't just messing around with your average science fair projects. He was tinkering with electromagnetic fields, using magnets and electric currents like a cosmic DJ mixing beats. He was convinced that the fundamental forces of magnetism and gravity were tied together by electrical attraction and repulsion. Faraday's theory was groundbreaking for its time. He proposed a field theory that aimed to link these forces in a way that made sense of how they interacted. But here's the kicker. Faraday was up against some serious limitations. Back then, they thought electromagnetic waves moved at a crawl compared to light waves. Little did they know, these waves actually zipped through space at the speed of light, which meant Faraday's theory was missing a crucial detail. Despite his brilliant efforts, Faraday's ideas didn't quite capture the scientific community's imagination in the way he'd hoped. His theory, while ahead of its time, lacked the experimental proof needed to sway the skeptics. So, as the years rolled on and Faraday's theories gathered dust, the stage was set for someone else to take up the gauntlet. Fast forward to the early 20th century, and we find Einstein, that brilliant, wild-haired genius grappling with the same problem but with a modern twist. Armed with observational data and a hefty dose of higher mathematics, Einstein sought to unify field theory in a way that Faraday could only dream of. Where Faraday was constrained by the limitations of his time, Einstein had the advantage of more sophisticated tools and a fresh perspective on the nature of the universe. Einstein shook up the scientific world with his general theory of relativity. Imagine the universe as a vast, boundless stage where gravity isn't just a force pulling objects together. Instead, in Einstein's view, gravity is the result of a curved, infinite fabric of space itself. It's like saying that the stage we're on isn't flat but bent and twisted by the presence of massive objects. Now, this was a seismic shift from Isaac Newton's idea of absolute space, a sort of cosmic backdrop that was unchanging and all-encompassing. Einstein's theory threw that out the window. In his model, waves of energy, like light and gravity, can travel through the void of space without needing the mysterious ether to carry them. But here's where it gets juicy, Einstein didn't just stop with gravity. He spent the last three decades of his life wrestling with the idea of unifying gravity with energy. It's like he was on a quest to find the ultimate cosmic recipe, mixing together the forces of the universe into one grand equation. Unfortunately, despite his best efforts, he never quite nailed it. Einstein was also famously skeptical of quantum theory, which was coming into its own around the same time. Quantum theory, in simple terms, is a mechanical model of how particles interact, but it's all about probabilities rather than certainties. And Einstein? Well, he wasn't a fan of the idea that randomness was the true nature of reality. His famous quip was, God does not play dice with the universe, just about sums his thoughts on the idea. Fast forward to today, and modern physicists are in a bit of a balancing act. They're straddling the line between Einstein's elegant relativity and the quirky probabilities of quantum theory. Meanwhile, the ether, a concept that once had everyone's attention, is mostly sidelined. So, let's talk particle theory. In the world of modern physics, when we mention particles, we're usually referring to the quantum scale bits and bobs that make up everything around us, the electrons, photons, and the like. According to the Encyclopedia of Modern Science, electromagnetism is described as the force between charged particles mediated by photons. 
In other words, photons are like tiny messengers that carry the electromagnetic force from one charged particle to another. Now, when it comes to gravity, things get even more intriguing. The idea here is that gravity is also mediated by a particle called the graviton, though this particle is more of a prediction from quantum gravity rather than something we've actually observed. It's like scientists are saying, we know gravity must have a carrier particle, but we're still waiting for the evidence to back it up. But here's where it gets interesting. There's another field of study that, while not quite mainstream, throws a wrench into our tidy modern physics picture, psi phenomena. This area delves into what might be called the psychic realm, a place where the rules of physics as we know them seem to bend. Psychics and those who study psi phenomena often report experiences that defy our understanding of space and energy transmission. Think of it as a world where magnetic-like, mutually attractive forces operate on a more ethereal plane than the particles and forces we measure with our modern instruments. What's fascinating is that they suggest that there might be more to the universe than what our particle theory and quantum mechanics can currently explain. It's almost as if there's an underlying layer of reality that's operating on a different frequency, one that our scientific tools aren't yet equipped to fully grasp. Let's take a little science refresher. In the realm of modern physics, elementary particles are those fundamental building blocks of the universe, think electrons, photons, and their quantum relatives. According to our current understanding, these particles travel at the speed of light. That's right, they're zipping around at an incredible 299,792 kilometers per second, and they don't seem to slow down. Here's where it gets really interesting. Relativity theory tells us that because the speed of light is constant no matter where you are or how fast you're moving, there's no such thing as a rest frame for light. This means that elementary particles, which move at this unchanging speed, are considered to have what's known as zero rest mass. In simpler terms, they don't have mass when they're just hanging out in space. So far, so good, right? But here's the twist. Our entire understanding of these particles is based on phenomena we can observe, which is tied to the speed of light. Our perception of reality and everything we measure hinges on this cosmic speed limit. Now, here's where things get a bit sticky. If we're using the speed of light as our benchmark to define these elementary particles, we might be overlooking some significant aspects of reality. What if our perceptional horizon, the range of what we can see and measure, isn't the full picture? Imagine trying to map out the entire universe using only a flashlight. You might get a good look at the area illuminated by the beam, but you're missing everything in the shadows. Similarly, if our definition of elementary particles is limited by our perceptual constraints, we might be missing out on a whole range of phenomena that don't fit neatly into our current models. I propose a paradigm that's a bit on the speculative side but brimming with intrigue. It's based on the idea that all solid bodies, yes, everything around us, contain and radiate what we might call energy fields or auric fields. These fields are made up of particles so rarefied and elusive that modern electronic instruments can't detect them. Let's call these particles, etherins. Now, I know what you're thinking, etherins. That sounds like something straight out of a sci-fi novel. But hear me out. If these etherins do exist, they'd be incredibly fine, much like the hypothetical ether of old, but with a modern twist. The controversial assumption here is that these superfine particles would be subject to the same forces we're familiar with, like magnetism, just like electrons and photons are. Imagine if these etherins could interact in ways similar to electromagnetic phenomena. This means they could potentially exhibit behaviors like mutual attraction or energetic transmission. It's a bit like adding a new layer to our understanding of how energy and forces work. The real kicker here is that if etherins are everywhere, including inside matter itself, then everything we see and touch is composed of energized etherins. It's a radical idea that suggests our entire physical reality is built upon this fine, energetic fabric. In other words, the solidity of our world might be just a manifestation of these etherich fields at work. If we take the idea of ultimate particles, those etherins I mentioned earlier, and imagine them getting magnetically energized, they could potentially start aggregating with each other. Think of it like this. If these tiny particles were charged up with magnetic energy, they might stick together and form increasingly larger structures, like atoms. Now, if this sounds a bit like science fiction, bear with me. 
The modern ether concept naturally leads us to the idea that everything around us is infused with these auric forces. These aren't just your everyday electromagnetic waves. Instead, they're so finely tuned that our current technology can't quite pick them up. We're talking about energy transmissions on a scale so small that they're beyond our current detection capabilities. Imagine two different auric fields, each vibrating at its own frequency. If these fields were to resonate with each other, it would be akin to how magnetic fields interact in physics. This resonance could potentially explain some of those mysterious psychic phenomena and other instances of mutual attraction between different bodies. Now, here's where it gets really intriguing. If these interactions are happening on such a fine scale that we can't detect them with our current technology, then many of the psychic phenomena and subtle interactions we hear about could be explained by these resonating auric fields. It's like discovering a whole new layer of reality that's operating just out of sight. Today, we're diving into a pivotal moment when science took a hard look at the concept of the ether and tried to either confirm or debunk its existence. Let's rewind to 1887, a year that turned out to be a real game-changer. This was when the famous Michelson-Morley experiment took center stage. Now, don't let the name fool you. This experiment wasn't about making a Michelson-Morley cocktail. No, it was about determining the Earth's velocity through the so-called ether. The setup was pretty intricate. Imagine a high-tech version of the old, find the hidden object, game but with light waves. The scientists compared how light waves behaved when viewed from different angles, trying to see if any changes would indicate the presence of the ether. The results? They were a bit of a buzzkill for ether enthusiasts. The experiment was meticulously conducted, and it seemed to show that the ether didn't exist. To many physicists at the time, and for a long while after, this was considered the knockout punch against the idea of the ether. It was like the universe's way of saying, nope, no ether here. Despite this, the ether wasn't completely out of the running just yet. Even as relativity theory and quantum mechanics gained traction and became the new darlings of the scientific world, many prominent scientists still held onto the ether concept well into the 1920s. In fact, Albert A. Michelson himself, yes, the very same scientist who conducted that famous experiment, wasn't quite ready to let go of the ether. Michelson was like that one friend who insists on sticking with their old favorite band even though everyone else has moved on to new hits. So, picture this, Einstein's theory of relativity was the big ticket in town, but there was a rival theory that was also stirring up some excitement. Enter Professor TJC. He had his own take on the ether, one that proposed a different kind of gravity wave theory. C's model explained gravity and magnetic waves as longitudinal waves traveling through the ether, while light waves, heat waves, and radio waves were described as transverse or shear waves. In simpler terms, C imagined the ether as a kind of cosmic medium where different types of waves moved in different ways. Gravity and magnetic waves would ripple through it like compressions and expansions, longitudinal waves, whereas light and radio waves would move like waves on the surface of a pond, transverse waves. It was a bold attempt to reframe how we understood wave motion in the universe. Although C discussed the idea of ether particles in his writings, he didn't fully develop the concept of magnetic resonance versus non-resonance, that's a whole other layer that would come later. But his theories were not without influence. In fact, they caught the attention of none other than Nikola Tesla, who was a huge advocate for new ideas about wave motion. In a 1922 discussion, Tesla referenced C's work, highlighting his discussions on the smallest particles of the ether, which C aptly named etherons. Tesla's endorsement was a significant nod to C's ideas, as it showed that even the great Tesla saw potential in C's ether theory. C observed something quite remarkable about how waves behave. He pointed out that when you measure waves, be they sound waves or light waves, they tend to spread out or increase in amplitude the closer they are to a massive body like the sun. This observation fits neatly with the idea that an ambient medium, like the ether, exists and thins out as you get closer to cosmic bodies. Imagine waves moving through a thick fog compared to moving through clear air. In a thick fog, the waves would spread out more as they try to navigate through the denser medium. C suggested that a similar effect might be happening with the ether around massive celestial bodies. As these waves get nearer to something like the sun, the ether's density changes, causing the waves to widen out. 
But wait, there's more. In 1919, C made another compelling point. He criticized the physicists who were jumping on the Einstein bandwagon, arguing that they were overlooking some significant objections. C highlighted that some mathematicians, who were caught up in the elegance of Einstein's equations, seemed to forget that deflecting starlight near the sun was a physical issue, not just a mathematical one. He believed that the same observations supporting Einstein's theories could also lend credence to the ether concept. C was essentially saying, hey, folks, if we're going to use these observations to support one theory, why not consider they might also support the ether theory? It's like he was calling for a broader perspective on how we interpret the data. C's model was primarily a wave theory. He never really dug into the concept of particle resonance. But let's imagine for a moment if he had. How could the idea of resonance fit into his ether theory? What if it could shed light on some of the more enigmatic phenomena, like metal bending or spoon bending, those classic tricks that make you go, how on earth is that possible? Here's a thought experiment. If we accept that all solid bodies, like you and me, or even a spoon, have their own etheric auric energy fields, we could start to explore how these fields might interact. If these fields were to resonate with each other, it might explain how one object, say, a human with focused intent, could influence another object, the spoon, from a distance. Imagine this, each object has its own tiny particles generating these etheric fields. If the fields of the human and the spoon resonate, the energy from these tiny particles could potentially affect the spoon structure. Essentially, the energy waves coming from one object could have an impact on another, causing it to bend or change in some way. This idea isn't just about bending spoons. It could also apply to other unexplained phenomena, giving us a new way to think about how energy and intention might interact across distances. The concept of resonance, then, could be a bridge connecting our understanding of ether with these seemingly paranormal occurrences. The ether aura model could explain a lot of the strange and unexplained phenomena we encounter. It fits well with the idea of psi, those enigmatic psychic abilities that seem to defy our usual understanding of physics. If we consider that every solid body has its own etheric aura, this model could offer a new way to grasp how these auras might interact in ways we currently can't fully measure or detect. But let's shift gears and look at something even bigger, gravity and magnetism. Now, I won't get too bogged down in the nitty-gritty of unified field theories here, that's a whole other galaxy of discussion. However, a few key points might help you see why the ether aura theory is worth considering. First up is magnetism. According to the ether aura model, the Earth's magnetic field could be explained in a more straightforward manner. Today, physics tells us that the Earth's magnetic field originates from complex processes in the planet's core, which is about 2,000 miles down. They're talking about radioactive decay and other intricate phenomena that are tough to investigate directly. It's like trying to understand the workings of a watch by only peeking through a tiny crack. Now, the ether aura theory offers a simpler explanation. If you think of the Earth as having a massive aura, an etheric field enveloping our planet's surface, then the magnetic field could be a natural result of this aura interacting with the surrounding ether. Instead of getting lost in the depths of the Earth's core, you could consider that the magnetic field is a surface-level phenomenon influenced by the etheric energies present around and within the Earth. This perspective doesn't just simplify the Earth's magnetic field, it might also help us understand how magnetism operates on a more universal scale. By applying this model, we might find that the interactions of etheric fields offer a clearer, more cohesive picture of the forces at play. According to the ether aura theory, the massive quantities of atomic particles inside our planet could be producing an immense amount of magnetic energy. This energy would combine to form what we might better call the Earth's aura, rather than just its magnetic field. So, picture the Earth as this grand, energetic being with a colossal aura swirling around it. Now, here's where things get really interesting. The Earth's inner structure isn't a simple, smooth setup. We've got rock layers of various types stacked in all sorts of irregular arrangements. Think of it like a giant, complex puzzle, with pieces that don't fit together neatly. This irregularity means that the Earth's inner auric forces would intersect and interact with each other at different angles. This is where linear resonations come into play. In physics, when one energy field crosses another at an angle, the magnetic forces within each field start to interact in a very specific way. 
It's like when you've got two streams of water meeting at a certain angle, they mix and create turbulence. Similarly, when auric fields intersect, the magnetic poles of the particles within these fields tend to align themselves. They sort of line up in the same direction, creating a stronger, more coherent magnetic field. So, in essence, the Earth's inner magnetic energy isn't just a uniform field. It's a dynamic, resonant force shaped by the complex arrangement of materials inside the planet. These intersecting auric fields create a powerful, magnetizing effect, giving us the magnetic field we observe from the surface. So, let's rewind to the very beginning, the Big Bang, an unimaginably vast explosion that sent matter hurtling outward in all directions. This wasn't just a simple bang, it was a cosmic firework display on an epic scale. The explosion blasted particles away from the center, creating a chaotic but magnificent mess. Now, imagine that within this primordial chaos, there were these tiny, elusive particles I like to call etherons. As these etherons raced through the expanding universe, they would have collided and brushed against each other, much like marbles rolling around in a pinball machine. These collisions and interactions would have set the etherons spinning and given them magnetic polarities. Over time, these spinning etherons, each with its own magnetic charge, would have gradually built up magnetic forces throughout the universe. This process is like stirring a pot of cosmic soup, where the magnetic forces start to blend and spread, ultimately shaping what we now refer to as our magnetic universe. In essence, the very earliest linear forces we observe today would have originated from this primordial chaos. The interactions between etherons in those first moments after the Big Bang would have set the stage for the magnetic universe we're familiar with now. So, let's break this down. Imagine the Ether Aura model as our guiding star. When it comes to explaining Earth's magnetism, this model offers a pretty straightforward picture. Here's how it works. Close to Earth's surface, we've got a dense concentration of auric particles, those etherons and their bigger, magnetic cousins. These particles are energized by the linear processes happening inside our planet. Think of it like a cosmic dynamo, where the spinning and interactions of these particles create the magnetic field we observe. Now, let's take a leap into space. Out there, the ether is a different story. Without the intense activity and energy processes found inside Earth, the ether in space is less energized. The etherons floating around in the vast expanse of space are oscillatory, they're like cosmic dances without a strong rhythm, lacking magnetic polarities or clear energetic directionality. In other words, while Earth's inner processes pump up the energy and magnetism of etherons near our planet, space itself remains relatively quiet and calm, with etherons drifting aimlessly. This contrast helps explain why Earth's magnetic field is so prominent and powerful compared to the background ether in the vacuum of space. Grab your mental flashlight because we're about to explore how the ether aura model can shed light on the relationship between Earth's magnetism and gravity. Right around Earth, in what I'm calling the auric zone, the ether is like a cosmic stew of energized particles. As these etherons aggregate, they combine to form larger and more complex structures like atoms. This process causes the ether here to become somewhat thinned out, like the air thinning out as you climb a mountain. Now, let's drift out into the vast expanse of space. Here, the ether is a whole different story. It's filled with smaller, more numerous etheric particles that haven't been energized by the processes happening inside Earth. Even though these outer space etherons are unenergized and can't resonate with Earth's auric field, they're still forceful. Think of them as tiny cosmic crowds trying to fill a void. These outer space etherons exert a sort of pressure toward Earth, what we might call the force of gravity. They're trying to fill the space around our planet, pushing inwards and creating the gravitational effect we experience. This is similar to how air pressure pushes against you from all sides, but on a cosmic scale. So, here's the twist in the magnetism gravity story. As particles from Earth's auric field drift farther out into space, they start to lose their energy. It's like a cosmic game of hide-and-seek where the particles, once brimming with energy, gradually become less dynamic. They disaggregate and revert to their original state as pure, unenergized ethers. Think of it like a balloon losing air as it rises higher. As these energized particles spread out into the vacuum of space, they lose their spark and turn back into these basic, unenergized etherons. 
This process helps explain why the magnetic influence we feel on Earth doesn't extend infinitely into space. In wrapping up, it seems the ether theory has the potential to clarify a number of basic phenomena that current physics still struggles to explain. It's almost like we're looking at a cosmic jigsaw puzzle with a few missing pieces, and the ether theory might just provide those missing pieces. Shouldn't science start paying more attention to these ethereal realms and phenomena that stretch beyond our everyday experience? There could be incredible discoveries waiting in the wings if we open our minds to these possibilities. Who knows what new vistas and insights could emerge from embracing the ether's enigmatic role in our universe?